Thanks very much for that introduction. So just an overview of the objectives of my talk tonight. Um, I want to help uh, you all understand the indications for surgery in patients with ulcerative colitis and then to also understand indications for surgery in patients with Crohn's disease. And then finally, look at different surgical options with patients with inflammatory bowel disease. As you all know, inflammatory bowel disease is broadly categorized into two uh, main categories. Ulcerative colitis is a diffuse uh, disease of the lining of the colon and rectum, so the large bowel, and this causes a lot of inflammation. Surgery can be curative for patients with ulcerative colitis. In stark contrast to this, Crohn's disease is again an inflammatory condition, but it affects the entire GI tract. So it can affect anywhere from the stomach all the way to the rectum and anus. And unfortunately, surgery cannot cure Crohn's disease, and we must tailor our surgical management to treating the symptoms while minimizing some of the risk for future complications of recurrent disease. Looking specifically at ulcerative colitis, we often are asked to operate on patients with acute fulminant colitis, so very severe um, inflammation. Other patients we operate on are patients who have medically refractory or dependent disease, patients who are on medications for a long time who choose that they don't want to be on medications anymore. More often than not, we are also asked to operate on patients who have dysplasia or abnormal tissue uh, developing in the colon, either precancer or cancer. And then finally, especially in the pediatric population, failure to thrive or failure to grow is another indication for surgery. Depending on the surgical indication, the surgical options are a little bit different, but ultimately surgery is curative, once again, for most of these patients with ulcerative colitis. So fulminant colitis or severe colitis is quite rare now just because we have such great medications to treat ulcerative colitis. And this can include patients who develop a, a toxic megacolon or a very large colon that can then perforate or develop a hole in the colon, or patients who have bleeding, uh, uncontrollable bleeding from their colitis. Most patients um, are, admitted to the ho are admitted to hospital. They're aggressively treated with IV fluids, sometimes antibiotics, sometimes steroid medications like prednisone. And we have to make a decision to operate, take out the colon fairly early within the first two to three days that patients are admitted because they either get better quickly or they deteriorate fairly quickly. Patients who have toxic megacolon, again, get very uh, bloated. The colon can become very enlarged to the point where it perforates and stool leaks into the abdomen. And we have to operate usually emergently in these situations. In these situations, we have to take out the entire colon. Um, it's called a subtotal colectomy because we're leaving part of the rectum behind. So not the entire large bowel comes out, but the colon comes out. And some of these operations are done via keyhole surgery, minimally invasive surgery, or with a big incision in the abdomen. And part of that depends on the comfort of the surgeon. Part of that depends on the status of the patient and the status of the colon. And unfortunately, some, most of the time, these patients um, who require their colon to be taken out, taken out emergently require an ileostomy or a stoma, a bag in the, uh, the ab abdominal wall where the stool comes out. Some patients also get a mucous fistula, which is a smaller opening in the abdominal wall that doesn't really put out very much other than a little bit of mucus. The subtotal colectomy that we perform emergently is not definitive treatment. It's usually part one of a many part series of things. And it allows us the opportunity to get the, the colon out, allows the patient to stabilize, recover, and decide what the next steps will be. This subtotal colectomy, taking out the colon, is usually for patients who are very, very sick with their colitis and we do it emergently or in patients who are dependent on steroids, such as prednisone, for a very long time. So once the colon is out and the patient recovers, we have um, some more decisions to make. At this point, it's important to decide whether we can proceed with reconstruction or not. 
The rest of the rectum needs to come out because it still does harbor uh, colitis and risks of uh, cancer and abnormal tissue. Some patients get a permanent stoma that they live with forever, and other patients can get an ilioanal pouch. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later. Choosing between options, whether to have a permanent stoma or a pouch, can be challenging, and it's often based on a number of different factors, patient factors including age, what other medical problems they may have, their occupation. It also depends on disease factors and quality of life factors. The most common indication probably now, um, as well as historically for surgery, is medically refractory disease. And this is a really difficult indication to define because for each and every patient and each and every doctor, it can be very different. So this depends on how medications are impacting the patient's quality of life, it can um, be related to how they're tolerating the medications, what sort of uh, side effects they have, and even the cost of medications. Finally, the, uh, the other indication for surgery is dysplasia. So this is when patients develop abnormal cells in the colon that can, become, that can be precancer or even cancer. And we know that in the first 10 years of being diagnosed with colitis, the risk of dysplasia and cancer is fairly low. However, if you have colitis for a long time, the risk increases, and it increases by about 1% per year after the first 8 to 10 years of having the disease. So when patients develop dysplasia, we can categorize it into high grade or low grade, and we know that patients who have high grade dysplasia, so the tissue is more abnormal, are more likely to develop cancer, and we would prefer to do surgery to take out the colon before the cancer actually develops. In these patients, once again, taking out the entire colon and rectum is curative, and then we have to make the decision as to whether we will do a restoration or not whether that patient will need an ileostomy, a permanent stoma, or whether they can have a pouch procedure. The important thing to understand here, though, is that there are functional consequences of having an ileoanal pouch procedure, and there's generally good outcomes with relatively low com complication rates and an even lower failure rate. So just talking about the procedure, the most important thing is really patient selection. So in patients who have had their entire colon and rectum taken out, we can create a reservoir from the small, pow from the small bowel called a J-pouch, and we can connect this to the anus using staplers, usually in the operating room. And patients do have reasonable functional outcomes, but it will never be the same as, as if you compared this to patients who still have their colon and rectum in place. Patients who have pouches usually have six to eight bowel movements a day. Some patients wake up at night. Most patients are able to postpone defecation. What I mean by that is they will have urgency but can make it to the bathroom. So major incontinence is rare. However, lots of patients do have some episodes of incontinence or accidents with mucus and stool, and this is mostly at night. But many patients can manage their function and improve their function with dietary, dietary modifications or medical uh, management. Right after surgery, patients can develop uh, complications related to the pouch, infections from leaking or um, bowel obstructions, and late, patients can develop inflammation in the pouch even, bowel obstructions, and um, there, there is some reports of infertility, especially in women who've had pouch procedures, this data is really quite a bit older than uh, the newer data. We think that now that we're doing so many surgeries laparoscopically or with the minimally invasive approach, the risk of adhesions and scar tissue leading to infertility is much lower. Once you have a pouch, it still requires surveillance because you can get inflammation and cancer uh, right at that transition zone where we've done our stapled join. Switching gears entirely, Crohn's disease is a very different disease than ulcerative colitis. It's a very variable disease from patient to patient. 
and it's characterized in different patterns. So some patients have inflammation, some people have strictures or narrowing, and other patients have fistulas or abnormal connections. And we have to focus and tailor our surgical plan uh, to the patient and as well as to the location of disease. So patients who have inflammatory, bowel, uh, inflammatory patterns of disease usually develop um, ulcerations and thickening of the bowel, and this can lead to obstructive symptoms or partial blockages. If it's in the small bowel, and it can also lead to diarrhea or frequent bowel movements if it's in the large bowel. Other patients develop narrowing from chronic inflammation that's replaced by scar tissue and this disease is actually not really amenable to medical management once the scarring sets in and usually requires some sort of surgical resection. And finally, some patients can get um, perforations or fistulas, abnormal connections between parts of the bowel that require surgery. As I mentioned before, uh, Crohn's disease can affect any part of the small bowel, uh, any part of the GI tract, so anywhere from the, from the mouth, the swallowing tube, the esophagus, to the stomach, to the small bowel, and anywhere in the colon. Patients with Crohn's disease also can develop perianal disease in the form of fistulas and abscesses. Why do we operate on patients with Crohn's disease? So one of the main reasons is obstruction or blockages. Another, another indication is perforation, so if a hole develops in the colon. Some patients can get fistulas or abnormal connections to the skin, to other organs. Unlike, um, or sorry, it, like in ulcerative colitis, some patients have medically refractory disease. Other patients can have recurrent bleeding. And finally, patients with Crohn's disease can also develop cancer uh, secondary to their inflammation. When I see patients prior to considering surgery, we really need to consider the symptoms that they develop, and we have to delineate the specific symptoms to see if the surgical management will actually help cure the symptoms. And one of the most um, common indications for surgery, like I mentioned before, is obstructive symptoms or, or signs of blockage. So patients who have pain, bloating, especially after eating, and um, find food avoidances. Prior to going on with surgery, uh, one of the first things I do is delineate the anatomy, review imaging or get new imaging to find out exactly what parts of the bowel are affected, usually get a colonoscopy, and then examine um, the anus and rectum for abscesses, fistulas, narrowings, and strictures. We have to be quite thoughtful about the surgical approach and because one surgery can't be curative like in ulcerative colitis. We want to try to reduce multiple operations and the potential for short bowel syndrome. And because there are so many different indications for surgery, because there are so many different areas of the bowel that can be affected, there's obviously lots of surgical options in Crohn's disease. So commonly, if patients have small bowel disease, we can take out that section of bowel and put it back together. Sometimes we take out that piece of bowel and then provide patients with a stoma. That might be permanent. It might be temporary. We can do strictureoplasties, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, or bypass the area of, of small bowel that's affected, although this is quite rare. In patients who have Crohn's <coughs> disease affecting the, the colon, the uh, surgeries are much like I mentioned before. You can take out the entire colon, provide the patient with a stoma, um, or take out the entire colon and rectum and leave patients with a stoma. And the important thing to know here is that patients with Crohn's disease are not offered pouch procedures. So strictureoplasty is essentially where we take an area of narrowing, open it up so that it's not narrow anymore, but we don't like to do this operation if patients are not uh, very well um, with their nutritional status. We don't like to do this if there's lots of strictures in a short segment. And we don't like to do this if there's inflammation or infection in the area. Finally, just want to speak about patients who have anal disease. Uh, 
So patients with Crohn's disease can develop fistulas, abscesses, strictures, and this can be quite challenging to treat. And the reason that it's challenging to treat is many of our treatment strategies can damage the sphincter, the anal sphincter. But the anal sphincter is particularly important for patients who have Crohn's disease, who have, uh, ab um, who have diarrhea, and we don't want to affect their continence and make them have accidents after surgery. So we have to be very conservative. And I find that lots of patients are managed with antibiotics and biologics as opposed to surgery. One of the types of things that we often are asked to do are place cetons or to give stomas to allow that perianal disease to settle down. And sometimes perianal disease requires for the whole rectum and anus to be taken out and a permanent stoma to be created. And just lastly, I, speaking about cetons, um, cetons are essentially a drain, and we often use a rubber drain, like in the, in the picture at, at the bottom here, and it's like an elastic band. It comes from inside the anus to outside the anus. It allows the area to drain, allows the infection to settle down. Sometimes we can take them out afterwards once the inflammation settles down after patients have been on medications for a while, and other times patients live with cetons for a very long time. So I know I've gone over a lot of different uh, surgical therapies and uh, different options, especially in patients with Crohn's, but I think the takeaway message is that there are lots of, there are lots of surgical options. Uh, it, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's are not just medical diseases, and we are often, from a surgical perspective, asked to help out uh, in, the, in the treatment of patients with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. Thanks.